for joining me. Today is Wednesday of Holy Week, and on our journey through Jerusalem, through the story of Jesus, there are some challenging moments. There's a lot in Holy Week that can make us uncomfortable. We encounter anger, conflict with authority, discord, scheming, betrayal, violence, and death. In this mix, on top of all that, we find in the Gospels some apocalyptic passages. Now, I'm going to be honest, I tend to avoid these passages like a lot of us do. Perhaps it's because there have been several points in my life where I've heard too much reference to them. My life experiences have timed out such that as I was graduating from high school in 1999, we heard all of the panic about whether the world was going to end at the dawn of the year 2000. We've experienced in this time since then also panic around September 11th. In the year 2012, when we reached the end of the recorded Mayan calendar, and now again with the COVID-19 pandemic. There was an article on the front page of the New York Times last week about people who were wondering whether they were seeing signs of an end of days, of an apocalypse in the making. So I'm inviting you to join me in spending a little time in actually, actually looking at this concept. So let's look at it in the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to read now from the 24th chapter. As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise, and lead many of the people astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness and the love, many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Powerful stuff. Well, it's sometimes challenging, like I said, to encounter these passages. So let's spend a moment thinking about the context. The Gospel of Matthew was written in. It was written about the year 80 or 90 of the Common Era, which is about 50 or 60 years after the events it describes. This times out to be fairly recent after the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 by Romans. And this was a huge deal for Jewish and Christian people. We also might want to keep in mind that Romans and Greeks respected old religions more than new ones. And as Christianity started branching away from Judaism, it was seen as suspicious. There was lots of fear and suffering, and the times felt to many downright apocalyptic. Now this word apocalypse... It comes from the Greek language, and its meaning tends to have a particular flavor when it gets used in our popular culture today. And this meaning is a little skewed from the literal meaning in Greek, because the word originally actually translated just as uncovering 
we're unveiling. Now, apocalypse, in its original context, sometimes could be violent, as we are used to seeing in our movies, but it can also mean simply a revealing of a new understanding, a sort of mystical growth. Now, we often associate apocalypticism with prophets, and Jesus certainly was a prophet. But that we need to think about how we understand prophets, too, because biblical prophets were not about foretelling the future. They were not fortune tellers or seers in the, in the sense that we often think of it. Prophecy in the Bible is always about speaking to the current circumstances of the people to whom it is addressed, how they are out of sync with God's intention for the well-being of all creation, or how God intends to heal and to restore those who are suffering and oppressed. Also, I don't believe, I really don't believe that these passages were written with the intention of scaring us. I believe they were written for people who were already scared and it was about acknowledging the truly hard circumstances they were living in and promising that their struggles would not last forever. This text in Matthew, to the Christians of its day, to the community in which it was written and for whom it was originally written, were struggling with the, with the earth-shattering for them experience of the temple being destroyed, of the fact that they were being viewed with suspicion by their neighbors. There was a lot for them to be afraid of. They didn't know what to do with their circumstances. And so these words of Jesus warning them that, yes, there would be challenges, but also that these things were not the end of everything, that these things were only part of the experience and not the end of the story, and that God would have the last word. This actually makes this not a word to inspire fear, but a word to inspire hope. Now, the New Testament writers also generally expected Jesus to return and change everything within their lifetimes. And it's the latest books of, that were written in the New Testament that show signs of starting to struggle with the question of, well, we thought he'd be back again by now. And this, this question of a second coming of Jesus and when might that happen, we get mixed messages about that in multiple places in the Bible, even in this very chapter of Matthew we've been looking at. At one point, we hear a description of signs, and we met, we very frequently jump on those signs, trying to pinpoint, it does this, is, are these signs showing up now, or, or maybe now, uh, later on. But Jesus also, in this chapter, later on says, but about the, that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And then later he says, Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now, it's, it's an open question, one that we don't have a good answer for, as to whether these passages about the second coming of Jesus are literal or metaphorical. And... You know, there are, there are good points for both cases, but we might also remind ourselves that apocalyptic passages in the Bible and in other Judeo-Christian writings of that same era, we can find resonances of the events in their world. Symbolism was hugely important, and so just because we didn't see things exactly as are described in apocalyptic passages doesn't mean that those, those things described might not have been symbols for the events of their time, things like the destruction of the temple, things like oppression by the Roman Empire. Now, one of the other experiences we might have today is that signs that we hear referenced in apocalyptic passages, things like those earthquakes and famine and conflict, it's easy for us to find examples of them in our world today, but of course, our world is somewhat different than the world of the Bible because we have mass communication technology that allows us to know when these things happen far away 
in a way that the biblical writers never would have known about things happening on the other side of the planet. So these things were always happening in the world, in various places, just not all at once and all at the same time. So it comes to this that we can never know for sure whether apocalyptic hypotheses may be right, other than when somebody sets a specific date and it fails to come to pass in that exact time. But whether we understand apocalyptic passages in the Bible as literal or metaphorical, there is advice here that is always of ready value. There is always need to be ready, to be attentive. There's always a need for loving each other, for addressing the inequities that cause some to suffer, such as those who right now in our world, as we are wrestling with the COVID-19 pandemic, those who are losing their health insurance and at risk of eviction because their jobs are not deemed essential and they are not receiving the income, therefore, that they usually depend on. Perhaps in our circumstances, God just might be inviting us to let our circumstances reveal to us and unveil to us the problems with how we live together in society and how we can change so that we can love all of God's people and all of God's creation more fully. And perhaps, whether an apocalypse is violent or peaceful depends on whether we cooperate or resist the change. Because change comes. We can't, we can't fight it, we can't stop it. But we can control how we respond to it. We can choose to respond with love and faith, with trust in God and God's goodness. And it has been shown throughout history over and over again that this kind of trust, living in love, can change the world. <laughs>